Welcome to Soundbridge Music's Featured Artist Interview. In this series, we get to know front range artists who not only shape the local music scene, but who joined with Soundbridge Music in its mission to use the power of music to improve the lives of individuals and bring communities together. We're so excited to be here today with Kyle Donovan. Kyle has won numerous songwriting awards, hosts the podcast The Songwriter Hour, and is set to release his brand new album, Then and Now, later this month. Zero Three Magazine says Kyle plays with a gentle yet impassioned touch that wraps you around his lyrics like a soft blanket. Kyle has been kind enough to take some time out of his day to talk with us. Welcome, Kyle. It's good to be here with you, Dave. Good to see you. So, um, I was looking at your stuff. The, the first thing that jumped out at me was that you studied philosophy at CU. That's right, yeah. And I actually uh, got a philosophy degree from CU as well. So I wanted to start off with a philosophical question. Great, yes. Uh, I was hoping this is how this would go. All right, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um... I guess the question I want to ask is, do you believe that music, and, and I guess art in general, uh, has objective value, or is it pretty much just subjective this value? This is such a great question. Um, this is one of those questions for which there's no right answer, and I love that about it, that we can just talk about it all day long, but I will try to give you... <laughs> I'll try to give you uh, my best answer. I think... Music is something that contains a lot of mystery, which I like. I like that it's uh, it has mysterious and unknowable effects on people. You know, when a choir is singing, for instance, their heartbeats all sync up, and that's kind of mysterious and cool. I, I think that music has a power that's not very well understood, and it, in the sense that we don't understand all the ways that music affects people and affects the world around us, I do think it has an objective power to it. I mean, you see vibrations on a plate um, of basically like iron, um, particles of iron, and when the plate vibrates at different frequencies, the iron creates patterns. Um, you know, music and, and vibration, if you want to get spiritual about it, I mean, music and vibration, the, the not that I'm a religious person, but the, the Bible basically starts the, the, the Old Testament, you know, that God created the heavens and the earth by speaking. You know, first there was um, the Word. Um, and so I think in a mysterious sense, yes, I do think music has some sort of objective power. So how does philosophy inform your music? Huh? Good question. Um... I think for me, my music is informed more by um, a personal uh, sense of story, um, the sense of um, the universality of stories. Um, that's really what this album um, that I'm coming out with this month is all about. It's called Then and Now. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, I was talking with someone uh, from Salt Magazine, Miranda in January of this year, and she said something like, it sounds like a very human album. I was like, I love that, you know, a humanist kind of album. And so, it's insofar as humanism is, is a philosophy, I think that's sort of the, the theme of, of this album is, you know, that we all deal with um, similar struggles and problems in life, even though our, our positions and the things that we're born into are quite different. So when and where did you start doing music? Well, I started really young. I started out singing. Um, and I sang in the car with my mom, and I sang in the shower, and I sang in school choir, um, and I sang to, you know, Beatles records with my dad every Christmas. Um, all the time, really. Um, but yeah, it really started out, you know, with the voice for me, and sort of evolved. Um, I think when I was about nine years old, I started playing the violin. That was actually my first instrument. Um, and... I just couldn't keep it on my shoulder. I kept bringing it down in my lap. Hmm. And so eventually my parents got the hint and they were like, all right, we'll, we'll just get you a guitar, do the guitar thing. And that was around 14, I think, that I got a guitar. But yeah, I continued to sing in uh, throughout high school and then in college I did um, vocal jazz groups and um, yeah, like I said, choirs. And then I did acapella groups, um, even a barbershop quartet in high school and then in college. So um, yeah, it was really centered around singing for most of my life. And then... Right as I exited college, um, I started taking things a little more seriously. I had a desk job that I really didn't like. I really was not happy there. And it took one of my friends to tell me, hey, 
you know, um, you're not, you're not happy here. And I can see that. And so, you know, he really pushed me toward the musical, um, path. And so I began writing songs and that was about five, about five years ago now Mm. that I started really writing songs. Um, and you know, I was lucky enough to be able to quit that desk job and start making music right away. And, um, I moved back to New York, which I thought I'd never do because I came out here to Colorado in 2009. It's been 10 years that I've been on here now. Mm. Um, I never thought I would go back to New York, but I ended up heading back and moving back in with my dad. And um, that was an amazing experience to be able to just focus on music and research and um, write and record and work super hard that, that year to sort of get things off the ground. And that's how it sort of started out for me was just recognizing that I wanted to pursue something other than the nine to five desk job and that there was an opportunity in, in music for me because, you know, that same friend, Thomas, uh, you know, among other people said like, I believe in you, man. I think you could do this. You know, if there's anyone I know who could make the musical thing happen, it's you go, go, go for it. Go try. Now so. you, you, f- you fill a lot of different roles, not just a, a, as a band member or as a solo act, but you also do sound engineering and pr- production. That's right. So, uh, what's it like to wear that, those hats? Yeah, I love the sound engineer hat. Um, <clears throat> I love, you know, the process of finding the sweet spot with a microphone. Um, I, I love the the sort of grinding work that goes into post production and editing, and um, you know, finding you know in, in EQ, you know, finding those frequencies that you want to take out. I, I love sort of fine tuning different um, arrangements. Uh, Clandestine Amigo has a song on the radio right now, Unsatisfied, and you know, I, I recorded and produced that song actually right here in this room that we're sitting in, which is great. Um, yeah, I, I I really adore the role of playing sound engineer. It's a little bit different in that. The creative freedom is not nearly as great. It's more of an interpretation, I think, than a creation, um, which is totally fine. It's just a, it's just a different role. Um, one thing that you'll probably ask about is the podcast that I do sound for as well, and that that role is just maybe my favorite of, of any of the things that I do because I get to combine um, the stage presence and the creativity of of creating content and you know being creative on the stage with the sound engineering and an aspect of sort of that that mysterious spiritual thing that I was talking about earlier when it comes to music where I'm helping to create a space where um, community can come together and people can enjoy a common experience and have a common um, sort of emotional ride. I just love that. So yeah. And what was the name of your podcast? It's called The Songwriter Hour. The Songwriter Hour, and that's uh, over at uh, uh, Still Sellers. That's right. We do that on the second Thursday of every month at Still Sellers. Yeah. Can you describe your uh, guitar picking style and and how you developed it? Sure, yeah. You know, I'm mostly self-taught on guitar. I took a few lessons when I was uh, first starting out, and I found those to be mostly unhelpful because Mm -hmm. the people that I was learning from were trying to teach me to read off of a page, and I already knew how to to read off of a page, but I played violin instead. And I was kind of like, okay, we've done the Suzuki thing. I want to play songs. I Mm want to, you know, I want to play Beatles songs and Counting Crows songs and, um, you know, the stuff that I was into. And so I kind of stopped taking lessons maybe a year in or so. Um, I don't know. And yeah, I just started sort of uh, picking things up from the internet, um, picking things up from friends who would show me. Um, yeah, and and so the picking style that I use on guitar, it's a form of Travis picking, which is like a, you know, a finger style. And um, I try to keep it varied but sometimes I recognize that I'm using you know, similar patterns or doing, doing similar things. I think for me, the, the finger style piece on guitar is about, because I've, I've used a pick and I've played a whole song just strumming with a pick. And there's a beauty to that and a simplicity to that. And especially go, you know, going into the talking about engineering and, and production, you don't necessarily always want a complicated finger style guitar part under a folk song. A lot of the time what's going to lend itself best to the music is just a little bit of strumming in a really simple pattern. And so I think there's a time and place for that, but I, I think for me the finger picking is really an attempt to get to a place where I feel like I'm pushing a boundary, where I feel like I'm pushing um, the envelope and, and trying something new, challenging myself, challenging the listener to um, hear something that they might not be used to. And so my finger style guitar might sound a little bit different from typical finger style guitar and that's probably both because I'm self-taught and because I'm kind of trying to push that boundary all the time. When when you first came on the scene, when I first heard about you, yeah. you just seemed like 
you had everything together. I uh, you 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 had a name. You were suddenly playing with a lot of folks. You had your own podcast all of a sudden. And I, to me, for I mean, it, it, it grad. You know, maybe it took place over a couple of years, but it felt to me anyway that you just you came on the scene fully formed. Once I heard your name, you were just everywhere. Um, and you know, that's appearances. But I'm curious. You know what? You know how do you feel right now? Uh, one one question would be. Um, was there ever a point where you felt like you were struggling so much that you wanted to give up the music business? And how did you get over that hump? Let's start with that. I don't think there's been... Wow. First of all, thank you for saying all that because it's a really kind thing to say. And I'm glad that at least there's the appearance that I have everything together. That's good, right? Um, yeah. I guess I want to go back and actually go back to what you spoke about before, which is you know this this feeling of fully formed or something like as soon as you get on the scene and I, I will gladly acknowledge that my path has been really quick that I've gotten from just starting out on you know I mean in the first year when I talked about moving back to New York I played a hundred shows that first year wow. and a lot of that I owe to my dad because he just allowed me to live in the house rent free no expectations and do research and book gigs and record music and work super hard and so you know that privilege to be able to focus so um, laser focused on um, sort of what it means to succeed and pursuing that path of questioning what it means to succeed and working hard toward my own definition of success was huge. That's a, that's a really big part of it. So I want to acknowledge that right away. So I moved back to New York, did all that, and then pretty quickly decided to move back to Colorado. I was on a nationwide tour that I had booked, and I played a house concert in Colorado. I was like, that's it. I know I belong here. You know, I'm glad that I left so I could establish the music thing, release some music, you know, get my promo act together, get all the social media together, get some music released, but now I'm ready to move back. And so, you know, upon moving back to Colorado, I was able to work with some um, contacts that I'd had from before I left, specifically Daniel Herman, who's a, a sound engineer and an amazing piano player. He plays on um, this album, Then and Now, that I'm coming out with. And he also produced my last album, The Kindness of Strangers. Um, and he was able to hook me up with The Laughing Goat and bring me in there and uh, help me to establish a job running sound there. And so through my connections at The Laughing Goat, um, which is, you know, if for those of you that don't know, The Laughing Goat is an amazing venue in Boulder that uh, helps sort of um, aspiring and newly established, maybe maybe even established songwriters sort of get a foothold in Boulder. It's one of the few independent music venues in Boulder. Um, and so through the connections that I made at The Laughing Goat, I was really able to widen and broad, broaden that um, scope. I, I started attending uh, some open mics up here in Longmont uh, where I met Antonio Lopez and Jessica Carson. Um, and, you know, started collaborations with both of them. And, and I think to, yeah, to be really honest about the process, I think it has happened quickly. And like I said, I, I, I feel privileged for that. But I also think that I've spent a ton of time introspectively asking myself what I want out of this. And I've known for quite a long time that the, the key in my life to success or happiness or satisfaction or whatever you want to call it, flourishing, if you want to go the ph philosophical Let's route, go. is is people and are, are those friendships and those connections that you make. And so I've spent a lot of time making, you know, personal and professional connections with people. And that's resulted in a lot of good things happening. Um, so well, uh, I, just as a, a bit of a follow-up, just w what do you feel like you're struggling with right now career-wise? What, what's the next challenge for you that you're trying to uh, take on and, and get yeah. past? Thanks for that question. It's helpful because right, it helps me to reframe, you know, what is the goal? Because if you have a challenge, then you have to have a goal defining what's blocking that goal, right? Um, I think the easiest way to answer that for me would be um, to talk about this last album and how mm -hmm. it comes off to me. I think this album that I put together with the help of all those folks I just mentioned, um, then and now, has been a monumental effort. It took about three years to record. Um, I worked with three or four different sound engineers um, who took me into their studios and showed me the ropes and tried to help me um, with recommendations on plugins and gear and techniques um, and all the different musicians. And so I think the process of coming up with an album 
that was that that had such a wide scope and uh, such a huge breadth to it um it was a little bit um it stunted my ability to really focus on the journey itself i mean one of the important pieces of this whole thing is that you know the journey is the end in itself right if you're not enjoying making the music why are you making the music if you're not enjoying recording the album why are you recording the album and maybe there is an end goal to which that is a means but um what i'm trying to say here is that the next thing that i do the next project that i undertake i want to feel like while i'm doing it whether it's another album that i'm um releasing or a single maybe that i'm moving toward releasing instead of focusing on a huge project that I can embrace the process of doing it, that I can have fun while I'm doing it, that I continue to embrace those um, professional and personal relationships while I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, just to focus on the journey instead of the end point. And what inspired you to join Soundbridge Music? Well, again, going back to the community aspect of things, um, that's right in their mission statement is to bring community together through music. Uh, that's super important to me. I feel like when I when I first found out about Soundbridge, my friend Antonio, um, on the board, uh, introduced me to it and said, "There's this great organization. It's bringing people together. It's you know working for good causes. It's um, trying to create a sense of togetherness and community and common cause around music. You know, would you like to join?" And it was like the easiest sell in the world. Um, so I think. You know, the, the mission itself is great. I've done um, a show with Antonio at a yoga studio that was really mm. cool. It was um, through Soundbridge. We worked together on this show. And there was just this amazing, you know, everybody was like sitting or lying down in the yoga studio. And there was just this amazing vibe that emerged of, you know, people really being present with the music. And, you know, I'll use the term one more time, really experiencing some sort of mystery with each other through experiencing the same emotions and really being in a place of quiet. I think a lot of the time these days when we listen to music, it's in the car while we're driving somewhere or it's in the grocery store while we're g grabbing groceries or it's, you know, while we're taking care of some chore around the house. It's like... I think the mindful um, experiencing of music as a group has an inherent value that's not very well understood. But you know, like, w fewer and fewer young people these days are going to church, right? And outside of like sports, like maybe football, where's a place where we can go and all feel together and breathe together and intend together for the same thing to happen? Where can we ex experience that sort of spiritual sensation of togetherness? It, there's so few and far between. You know, if you're going to a bar, you're not focused on that. You know, if, if you're going to a library, you're insulated. You know, you're isolated by yourself. And most people aren't at bars or libraries or bowling clubs now. They're at home on Netflix, you know? So for me, this experience of music and especially creating the podcast, the songwriter hour, um, even, you know, the, the writing of my music and the performing of my music are all based around this intention that I think is really well aligned with Soundbridge, which is that intentional experiencing of music um, to create a feeling of a common experience and a common cause um, between people. Um, yeah, and it's mysterious and it's groovy, and I just love it. You've, you've already, I think you've mentioned all the, the, the key dates that are coming up already, yep. but do you want to do it kind of just more directly and yeah, just talk about what's coming up? For absolutely, you? let's do it one more time. So we've got uh, August. 8th, The Songwriter Hour, featuring Rebecca Folsom and Mark Oblinger. That's at Still Cellars at 7.30. Um, then August 9th will be the album release show at The Barn. That's a big thank you to everyone. It's a little early. The album's actually going to release on August 30th. So on August 9th, we'll get together at The Barn. It's limited to 100 people. If you want to know more, go on my website. Um, go on Facebook. You can find it there. But The Barn is this amazing, basically, house concert venue here in Longmont that's a repurposed barn. It's got uh, a dance floor and an amazing stage with professional sound and lights. I mean, it's, it's top-of-the-line stuff. And it's just one of the best places in Longmont to go and listen to music. So um, that's going to be a big thank you because I'm going to be grabbing food and drink and making sure that everyone has time to hang. And, um, you know, I'm going to be bringing Antonio Lopez and uh, Kate Farmer and Daniel Herman to that show. So we'll be performing some of the album there and maybe listening to a bit of the album, too. I've been considering that. <laughs> Um, and then August 29th at the end of the month is at E-Town Hall, and that's a co-bill with Bonnie and the Clydes. So that's going to be, you know, 220 seats roughly. So come, bring your friends. It's going to be a huge dance party at the end, and, you know, we're going to celebrate the album to the, at the beginning. Um, I'm going to bring 
uh, a full band. Lee Ormanellis, who performed on the album, is going to be there. Um, Antonio and Kate will both be there as well. Jessica Carson is going to be there on piano. Um, so that's going to be an amazing show as well. So those are kind of the big dates coming up for me and the album. Fantastic. Well, Kyle, it has been an absolute pleasure talking Dave, to you this thanks afternoon. thanks so much for taking the time right. and uh, asking such insightful questions. I, I, I loved it. It was, it was a joy. Uh, best of luck to you, and um, I'll look forward to seeing you in the near future. Likewise. So, thanks, right. Dave. Be sure to catch Kyle Donovan live sometime soon. Visit kyledonovan.com for a full okay, listing of summer river. concerts. And also check Just out his podcast at thesongwriterhour.com. Be sure to check back next month for our next featured artist. And if you're interested in learning more about SoundBridge Music and becoming a part of Music for Change, check us out at soundbridgemusic.org. Her honey dip 